Come on, can we thank the Lord? Let's thank the Lord. Thank you, Lord. How about a big welcome to our online family too. Come on, let's welcome them today. So glad you're with us. Peace to your house. It's gonna be a good morning. You may be seated. You may be seated. Is it still raining? Uh, I'm actually gonna talk part of the message toward the end about storms this morning. And in first service, it was the Lord and me doing an illustrated sermon. And just at the right moment, there would be a big boom of thunder. And uh, so I'm, I hope the Lord will do it again this service. It was, it was awesome. You should have been here. So uh, we're just glad you're, you're all here today. Glad those of you are joining us at home or wherever uh, that you would be. Let me share a couple things with you and uh, hear the heart of your pastor. This is not uh, announcements. This is not just busy stuff that we're trying to get people to do. These are things that we believe as part of a church family, as part of a believer, are very vital for your life. These are, these are practices that you should employ in your life. And uh, the first would be stewardship or, or giving, giving. How many of you would acknowledge that every good thing you have has come from the Lord? All right, most of you. Well, for all of you, you need to know this. Every blessing you have has come from the Lord. And you need to acknowledge the fount from whom all blessings flow. And, and the Lord has set it up where we're to honor him and acknowledge that, not just grab and go. And so with your finances and the blessings in your life, you're to honor the Lord. And I believe this, that what you do with the first part of anything affects the rest of it. And so what we want to make sure is that we're honoring the Lord with the first part. And that kicks in a kingdom principle, which is this. Uh, Jesus said, if you put me first, put the kingdom first, he will help you with the rest. I ask you this all the time, how many of you could use a little help with the rest, okay? And uh, so it's putting him first is a major kingdom principle and practice that you want to have in your life. And then secondly, as a part of a church, you know, it's a larger church, and, and we want to make sure that everybody can get connected. How many of you are glad that your body has all the parts that it does have? Okay, and God is efficient about how he makes, you know, the body, whether it's large or small. And, and uh, so one of the ways that we have where you can be connected, find out more about yourself, find out more about what's going on in, in the ministry, and how you can be a part of that is what we call growth track. Everybody say growth track. And we have growth track every week. Who is it that we want to go through growth track? Everybody, everybody. And it's happening during this service, so please do not leave. Just plan on doing it next week. And uh, we're pretty excited too. We're moving it from room 401 to room 101. And so we've got a room that's gonna be all slicked out for a growth track that we'll be moving in a few weeks. But it's just an important thing that we really seriously encourage everybody to go through. And then lastly would be groups. And uh, I put it this way sometimes, you know, it's good that we're in rows, but sometimes you have to get out of rows and get in circles. You've gotta get face to face, you gotta get up close with a smaller group of people and where you can know and be known, and you can laugh together, cry together, pray together, encourage one another, just be there for one another. And so we have uh, groups, and I would encourage you to get involved in those. We also have what are called care groups, and those are for certain, um, you know, maybe special things that are going, challenging things that are going on in your life. Uh, we're ready to help you in those ways as well, as well. And all of that goes together just to help you as a part of the church and also um, to, to grow and, and to strengthen in your, in your Christian walk. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, um, we're in a series called Back to the Bible. Everybody say Back to the Bible. Did you bring your Bible today? All right. Let's go ahead and do this, this declaration. Leave your Bible down just for a minute because I know they're heavy. Did y'all ever have one of those giant Bibles? You know, 25 pounders, okay. Um, if you brought one of those, please use two hands. Hey, I just, I just wanted to share with you before I got going in the message, over the last 10 weeks, we've uh, started doing the Stand Up Come Forward altar call. And uh, if, if uh, the numbers are, are right that I have, uh, as of second service last week, it's 180 people have walked the aisles and, and made a decision for Jesus. I'm thanking the Lord for that. Amen. Go ahead and lift your Bible up with me and put it back down just a minute. I just, I want to make sure you know what we're doing, okay? I shared this story last week. I'll share it just really abbreviated, but um, last century, uh, traveling with a, a Christian music group, and uh, this was way back in the time of cassette tapes, and um, 
a buddy of mine on the, on the road gave me some cassette tapes and he had just a real vibrant faith. He was a precious brother. And I said, what are you listening to? And he said, hey, you wanna listen, listen to these? And it was Bible teachers and I'd really not ever had that. And they were teaching faith and they were just, there was just a real fire to it. And one in particular that I really dearly loved uh, was Pastor John Osteen from Great Lakewood Church in Houston. His son Joel now pastors the church. Uh, Brother Osteen went home to be with the Lord a number of years ago, but he started every message with this declaration. Joel does a version of this, uh, and, and we're not trying to copy anybody, but for years and years, just studying, listening to the Word, this kind of primes your heart and gets your faith going as we get in the Word. All right, you're warmed up now. Everybody get your Bible up good and high. Let's declare this together. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Today I will be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I will never be the same. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. I will never be the same. Never, never, never. I will never be the same. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, we're in a series called, a short series called Back, Back to the Bible. And I honestly believe this. I believe this. We're about to celebrate 32 years as a church. And I typically teach in series. And I do believe that series, a, a series is a season where God is speaking something specific, you know, to us as a, as a church family. And I believe that God is calling us back to the Bible. We have so many other uh, distractions and voices and, and digital tools and everything else. And uh, I, just, I just believe God is calling us back to his word in a very, very special way. I did a series a number of years ago called More Than a Book. And I would encourage you maybe to go back and listen to that because I talk about canonicity and inerrancy and authority and a number of things regarding the Bible so that you can see that it is legit. And uh, so my goal today and in this series is not to defend uh, the Bible and I don't have to present it and try to make you believe it. I'm encouraging you to step across the line and see what the Word, what the word of God will do for you. Look with me in Malachi chapter three, if you will. It says, ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees or from my word and have not kept or obeyed them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord. How many of you know life would be better if you returned to the Lord and he returns to you? Oh, pastor, how dare you say that to me because I'm in church. Good for you, but that's just where you're sitting. I don't know where your heart is. And you wanna make sure that you return to the Lord. And he said this, if you draw near to me, I will what? I'll draw near to you. And he said, if you return to me, I'll return to you. Now, he never leaves you. But I just think it is just more dramatic and more noticeable in your life that when you make efforts toward God, you're going to sense God's work and help in your life. Now, he said, ever since the time of your ancestors, um, let me rephrase it, you drift away. You drift away. How many of you know we all have that tendency? We're, We're we're prone to drift. How I many of you know that drift never really ends up as a positive thing? None of you have ever drifted into your, uh, your uh, optimum body weight. <laughs> None of you have ever drifted into being debt free. None of you ever just drifted into, you know, your landscape is pristine or what. No, no, no. Um, Typically, these things in our life, there's a, a, an effort, an intentional effort, and I believe you have to be called back to it. And that's what the Lord is saying. He's, he's saying, um, hey, return to me. You've drifted. A whole bunch of you have drifted. And he said, you need to return. And in particular, I believe the Lord is calling us back to, back to his word. Now, normally, when you're crafting a sermon or a message you kind of build toward a point you have a big idea that you're going for and you kind of build toward it and then you ta-da you land it and I'm going to do it you know and I've had courses on that and decades of 
learning that. I've taught courses on it and graduate level even. So I understand that, but I'm going to do it completely different today. And we're just going to go right to the big point. Okay. You ever heard of rip the bandaid off? It's, do y'all know what I'm talking about? You know, it's like, ah, and we try to just peel it back. You just got to go for it. Y'all y'all ready? And just rip it. Uh, I've been swimming a lot and we have a pool at home. I've been swimming a lot and um, it's good for exercise. It's good just for fitness and health. Um, it's, it's enjoyable and relaxing too. Um, did you know the other day I burned 3,000 calories? Yeah, I actually had a pan of brownies and I left them in the oven and forgot about them. <laughs> that didn't really happen. I read that the other day. I couldn't wait to share it with you. So, all right. No. But um, when I get in the pool, you know, you know how this goes. You're getting in the pool and if you go in from the shallow end and it's cold and you're just like, you know, takes you 20 minutes to get out waist deep. Y'all with me? Or you go to the deep end. I go to the deep end. But even with that, and I just kind of hop down in, but even with that, and I don't do it out loud, but I go in my mind, five, four, three, two, oh, five, four, right? So we're just, gonna, we're just gonna go for it. So here it is, here's the big point. Five, four, three, two, one, you ready? The most profound decision you could ever make is to give the Bible first and final authority in your life. All right, let's close in prayer and uh, <laughs> listen to it again. The most profound decision you could ever make is to give the Bible first and final authority in your life. Now, I want you to read it with me. Read it with me. The most profound decision you could ever make is to give the Bible first and final authority in your life. And we're going to come back to this point several, several times today. The Bible must become authority in your life. It must become the authoritative standard for life, for faith, how you live. We need to go to God. We need to go to God's Word for answers Go to God's word for direction. Go to God's word for perspective. Can I get in your business for a moment? Some, some of y'all are watching way too much news. News comes from a perspective of darkness. By that I mean this. It's as if there is no God. So if all you hear is a perspective and a lot of it tainted, a lot of it running narratives, a lot of it bought out. So used to, you just get the, no, the news at six, noon, six, and 11. And then somebody came up with a bright idea. Let's have news all the time. And when you have news all the time, you gotta keep talking. And you run out of things to say. And the Proverbs say that where there is much talking, there is always sin. Sin means to miss the mark. And so when it's coming out of perspective, I'm not calling people evil or anything else like that. They're, they're not the problem. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. But when our news and information comes to us out of darkness, and by that I mean as if there is no God, then you're going to feel fear. Then you're going to feel upset. You're going to feel unnerved and unsettled. You're going to feel all of those things. And the corrector for that is perspective. And the correction for our perspective is to get God in the middle. And get God as the foundation and get God as the overarching thing of everything that's going on. I said to you a week or so ago, it's not all falling apart. It's all falling into place. God's got it. I'm not worried. The Bible even, it even tells us this. It says, they will not fear bad news because their hearts are steadfast trusting in the Lord. And when you know God's got you and God's got it all and there's nobody greater than God, nobody can outsmart God, nobody faster than God, nobody more powerful than God, nobody richer than God, 
nobody wiser than God, you might get on the bus for God. And so all that came out of this. Some of y'all are watching way too much news. And you're wondering why I'm on. Uh, 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 and then you hang out with your two friends. And what do y'all talk about? Uh, uh, uh. And the Bible says, lift up the hands that hang down. It says, lift up your countenance, all you saints of God. And give glory to the Holy One. We've got to get our eyes back on God. Some of y'all, your God is way too small. Way too small. And I'm going to tell you something. You have no idea how big, how strong, how wise, how great our God is. Amen. So we've got to get his word. Give it authority. Give it the right to give you information. Go to it for information and for answers and for direction. And listen to me. Go to it to get answers and perspective and direction. Don't just go to God's word for comfort. I'm convinced most Christians today go to God's word just for comfort. I talk to people all the time, Pastor, you can give me a verse on this. I, my heart's troubled. And I'm not making light of that because that's where our comfort is. Comfort and encouragement comes from the scripture. Amen? Amen. But don't just go to God's word for comfort comfort. You might actually need less comfort if you went to God for perspective. If you went to God's word for information, if you went to God's word for answers and guidance and let it guide and inform you. Everything, everything, there's an answer in God's word, either specifically or by principle. And God, because he's God, was able to do that so that we can go to God's word to help us with decisions. We can go to God's word uh, regarding attitudes. We can go to God's word regarding any situation, relationships, our views, our perspective, as I said. You can go to God's word and find out how to handle things. Some of y'all just handle things based on what culture says, what social media says. Back to your two friends, what they say. And we, and we handle things that way. You better find out how God says to handle things. This is the owner's manual. Well, me and my two friends, we want to touch the blade when it's running. Well, the manual may say, don't. Well, see, God is restricting my life. Is he? Might just be saving your fingers. Y'all hear me? How do I handle this? How do I handle that? How do I handle conflict? How do I handle crisis? How do I handle success? How do I handle alcohol? How do I handle this or that? You can't just take what culture and society is saying. You need to find out what God is saying. And here's a good thing. God is good. And God knows everything. And God knows best. And God loves you and God wants best for you. Can I get an amen from somebody here? And God is right, and he's pure. Amen. We believe that the Bible is the sacred, inspired, inerrant, infallible, eternal word of God. And it never changes. I said it never changes. It doesn't have to change. Everything else changes. IRS tax code changes. I have friends who are attorneys. I have friends who are doctors. I have friends who are mechanics. How I many of you know everything changes? Everything changes. The Word of God never changes. That's why I'm glad God called me to one book. I don't have to get the new spring edition of the Bible with all the changes. Please see the list of things cut out, and please see the things that have been added. And these things are pending. It's a forever settled book, and I'm so thankful for God's Word. How dare we treat it so lightly? How dare we treat it so lightly? How dare we fool ourselves and think just because we have one that it's not in us and that we're not renewing our minds and putting God's word in our heart and our minds and in our mouth. Amen. Amen. Go with me to Proverbs 30. Every word, say it. Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Look in Psalm 18. 
As for God, his way is perfect. The Lord's word is flawless. Now, it's almost identical verse to what we just read. I just used a different translation so you could see pure and flawless. As for God, his way is perfect. Look at me. There ain't nobody else like that. I said, there's nobody else like that. And the Lord's word is flawless. He shields all who take refuge in him. And here's the great thing about God. He doesn't change his mind. He doesn't have to walk back statements he's made. He doesn't have to backtrack. He doesn't have to delete anything. He doesn't make gaffes. He doesn't, he doesn't mess up. He doesn't have to change because of pressure or anything else. As for God, his way is perfect. His word, hear me, his word is flawless. It's pure. It's true. Amen. Amen. Now, let's look at the issue of authority. Authority. Now, again, I'm not going to, in this message, work to establish all the authority of God's word. I'm just... Um, I have done that. What I'm doing to this is I'm calling you to God's word. And what you need to do is give God authority. What does that mean? If you give somebody the authority, you give them the right to tell you what to do. Can I tell, it, tell you this about us humans? We don't like people to tell us what to do. We don't like... We, some of y'all don't even like it when one of our friendly parkers in the parking lot is. God, I got blessed in church and I get this in the parking lot. And it's because, sweetheart, there are more people came today than just you. And authority helps keep order that somebody has to say, do this, don't do that. And the thing about God, when he says it, he's not just being bossy, but he is the boss. Did y'all hear me? He is the boss. And I like him being boss. I said, I like him being boss. I'm his kid. And he's good. And he does good. And he works all things together for my good. And he doesn't abuse us. And he doesn't take advantage of us. He is for us like you cannot even imagine. I like God being boss. Amen. But humankind has always challenged authority. It was set in motion in the garden where the serpent, the embodiment of Satan, challenged the authority of God's word. Did God really say that? Did God really mean that? And that's how original temptation and sin was laced and wound in questioning and devaluing God's word. Then in the last roughly 50 years, now it's always been a case, but if you look a little closer in the last 50 years roughly, there's been a heightened sense of challenge and defiance against authority. Authority beginning with parents, with Police, with teachers, with scripture. And if you look closely at it, there's studies that show a lot of it came our way. Where did it come from? The enemy. But a lot of it got infiltrated and influenced into our culture. You ready for this? Through academia. Through higher learning through secular universities. Did you know that some of our leading secular universities that man, if you could get in there, used to be theological seminaries? And some of them you can't say Jesus there anymore. I'm not taking away from the good education that Mike would give, but it's all been laced with an anti-Bible, anti-God, anti-Jesus, question authority, And it's caused an erosion as it's got poured into our great minds. Add to that problems with authority is there's people that abuse authority. There's overreaches. There's abuse. There's there's neglect. 
There's people in authority who lose their moral authority and yet somehow end up being able to stay in authority. You have all of those things going on so much so that now all of us are uncomfortable pretty much with the concept of authority. I don't want anybody to tell me what to do, let alone you or you or you. And, 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 and we just kind of feel this. Am I, am, am I talking to myself or y'all? Y'all here this morning. And the, death, and the whole reason is the enemy desperately wants to keep you away from the truth of God's word. I said the enemy desperately wants to keep you away from the truth of God's word. He does not want you to know that God is his boss and that he's good. Now, in the book of Romans chapter 1, and we're going to look at a couple passages here in a moment. There's a specific verse, around verse 18. Don't look it up now, you can look up later. It says that God has some wrath, God has some anger. Would you, y'all understand that? We're actually told in Scripture, you're going to be mistaken if you, don't also, if you know only the goodness and not the severity of God. So there's, there's both sides of this. You want to be on the right side of it all. Now listen, you want to be on the side of the goodness of God. There's a goodness and a severity. That's the only way he's going to be able to make the whole, whole plan work. But the Bible reveals that God has some wrath. He has some anger toward those, listen, who suppress the truth. Because he knows this. If you come to know the truth, the truth will set you free. It's his whole plan. It's to, it's to ransom you back to himself through the shed blood of Jesus and not just not get you saved just so you can go to heaven, but to set you free. And he who the sun sets free is, is free indeed. You're really free. Not just in heaven. You can be really free right here. And it doesn't mean life is perfect, but I can be free. And not be subject and slave to sin and have other things have dominion over you in your life. But you can live as a child of God, a citizen of heaven, and fully helped walking through this planet and through this life. Amen. Amen. And so God has, God has anger because he said, that's so against my plan that when truth would get suppressed. Reading after that, let's pick up in verse 19, Romans chapter 1. Are you, are you with me still? For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. Watch. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived, you can see them, ever since the creation of the world. Keep going. In the things that have been made or created, so they are without excuse. Now, in theological terms, this is what is called general revelation. Can we bring that up? General revelation. General revelation means everybody can get it. Everybody, anywhere, everywhere, everybody can have this revelation. Revelation actually means to pull back the curtain. And until the curtain is pulled back, and it's pulled back so you can see, and you can't see it until he pulls back the curtain. That's what revelation is. And so there's a general revelation that God has pulled back the curtain on for everybody to see. And you're going to see it by what he made. So he created, so the invisible attributes of God, his power, his divine nature, that he is God, that he's a creator, and that he's powerful can be seen, you ready, in creation. So everybody, everybody say everybody. Some of y'all just need to get outside more. There's some people got their head down on a desk and they got headphones on and a screen or whatever else. And you need to get outside because outside will remind you that where there's creation, there's a creator. And where there's design, there's a designer. So the beginning of undoing the authority of God and his word, creation. So if in higher learning we can say there was no creation, there was a this or a that or a big boom or a that, 
And it was from the goo to the zoo to you. Not a new joke. Instead of there's a creator God, because if there's a creator, the creator is greater than the creation. And if he's greater than the creation, he's the boss. And if he's the boss, then I'm going to do what the boss says. And so mankind, through the slithery, slimy tricks of the enemy, doesn't want to be told what to do. We don't want a boss. We all arrived in some kind of goo. And, now, and, and, and so all of these things have been propagated through to take away from the authority. But here's, here's what the Bible says. If you go out and you see it, and you can look at it at a molecular level, you can look at it at a microscopic level, and you're going to find design. And the design didn't just drift into being. A holy, all-wise creator God created everything. And if you get out and you breathe it and you see it and you hear it and you feel it and you walk in it and a breeze blows on you and you see beautiful horses and you hear birds and you see trees and they're blowing in the, in the breeze and you get rain and all of that, don't kid yourself and think, well, let's just kind of happen. There's a creator God. And the Bible says so that I've shown it, I made it plain. So they're without excuse, which means this. No one can say there is no God. You can't say there's no God. And what everybody does know, because it's obvious out there and in, in, is revealed in this creation, what is obvious out there is there is a God. And he's pretty powerful. And he created. That's general revelation, but general revelation is not enough to get you saved. So we have to go a little bit further to what is called special revelation. Special revelation takes general revelation and it goes a little further. It's special and it's a revelation. The curtain is pulled back so you can see and you can't see it until he pulls back the curtain. Look at me. He's pulled back the curtain. And he wrote it all down. And special revelation shows you God's plan. It shows you God's nature. It shows the whole story. It shows his plan of salvation. It shows the timeline that I created all of this and then sin entered. And because of sin, we were separated. I didn't want to be separated from you. So in my love for you, and because I couldn't stand to be apart from you, and I, I don't want you to be lost, I sent my son and my son came into the earth and he did all the heavy lifting and he shed his own blood on the cross at Calvary so your sins could be forgiven. He was in the tomb and he conquered death, hell, and the grave. Third day rose again, conquering them. Forty days later, the Holy Spirit comes to help us in this life. The same spirit that was at creation. The same spirit who was at the resurrection. He said, I sent the same spirit to be with you and to be in you. And I sent you my word, special revelation, so you know how to live this life. So between general revelation and now special revelation that God has shown us who he is, what his plan is, and how to do life. That's why I'm calling you back to the Bible. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but apart from God's word, we don't know how to live. We don't know how to do this life. We come up with new causes and this and that. We're passionate and we'll fight you if you don't like our cause. But just back up a little bit and look at it all and it's constantly changing, constantly changing because none of it works. I'm sorry, am I yelling? Because God is right and his word is flawless. And he loves you so much. He went through a holy, incredible effort to get his word to you so you could see his plan and so you could know how to live this life. And then one day when this life is over, you're good to go. Amen? Amen. Woo! Uh. 
Romans chapter one, verse 21. For although they knew God, they knew God, they, he showed them in creation. They're without excuse. It's, it's just real evident to see there's a God and he created and he's pretty powerful. They knew God, but then they didn't honor him as God. They, they weren't able to get the further revelation. They, didn't, they somehow missed the further revelation. Did not honor him as God, nor give thanks to him. Look what happens. They became futile in their thinking. The best and brightest among us, apart from God, we become futile in our thinking, and then their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. The next 10 verses, don't read them right now, the next 10 verses show a 28 sin digression. It's an actual picture of our current culture. How do you get there? Because we don't know how to live without God. And we'll say, well, no, this is right. Or I want to do this. And we throw off the authority that is God's and his word that is God's. And listen, he's not trying to be bossy. He's just the boss. And he loves you and he knows the right way to do it. And his words are flawless. Can I get an amen out of everybody? Here we go. The most profound decision you could ever make is to give the Bible first and final authority in your lives. Read it with me again. The most profound decision you could ever make is to give the Bible first and final authority in your lives. Look at me. Come back to the Bible. Come back to the Bible. You got to believe that God is God. You got to believe that God is God. And if he's God, if he's God, then he's bigger than we are. He's smarter than we are. We've done this illustration over the 32 years of the church. Everybody do this real quick. Just interlock your fingers. Come on here. It's not that hard. Come on. That's the approximate size of your brain. Make any necessary adjustments that you need to there. <laughs> And the Bible says in Isaiah, the Lord says, your thoughts are not my thoughts. Your ways are not my ways. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so far are my thoughts and ways above your thoughts and ways. And yet he's given us revelation so that we could get into his thoughts and ways and you've got to believe that he is God and if he's God then he's boss he's he's the authority and if he's if he's God and he has final authority then you've got to believe that his word has authority and his words are flawless and he is holy are y'all hearing me that's who you want as God the Bible even says he's able to declare the end from the beginning, no one else can do that. You know, if you needed surgery, you wouldn't go to the parking lot at Walmart. I got a something here. Could you check this out? You wouldn't want something. Yeah, I think you got something there. Let me go in the store. I'll get something. I'll be back. You're going to have surgery. I want somebody who is qualified and trained and experienced and licensed. Are y'all hearing me? They're like, well, have at it, brother. You don't want your great grandma working on your car. I want, I want a certified mechanic. I want somebody who knows what they're doing. And, and then when they tell me something, okay, that's what we'll do. That's what we'll do. And God is God. Y'all listen to me. God is God. And if you don't know that now, and if you reject that now, one day you will know God is God. And I pray that his Holy Spirit will crowd you out, even in your restful moments. I, I'm, pray, I'm turning up my prayers for a whole lot of people. That God is going to get in your stuff and he's going to crowd you out till you turn to him. Further, you cannot accept Jesus and then reject his word. 
So we got a lot of social Christians. Oh, I love Jesus. I got a matter, bro. Whoop, but they do. If you follow his word, you've got to follow his word. Don't say you accept Jesus and then you reject. Now, reject may seem like a strong word for you, but let me, let me show it how it works sometimes. We ignore his word. When I was a kid, I'd be out playing, and my mom would yell, Timmy! Mom, we, and I know what she wanted, a bath and homework and then dinner. We are fighting a war here. (laughs) Or we're about to win the Super Bowl. She's calling, Timmy! So you know what I do sometimes? Ignore. I remember coming in later because I'd hear the fever going up. All right, I better go. I go home. Why didn't you come when I called you? I didn't hear you the first six times. (laughs) They're not allowed to beat beat children anymore. (laughs) But I was, and I'm a preacher. (laughs) That worked out. But you can't accept Jesus and then question him all the time or alter his word. Well, I know the Lord said that, but me and my two friends. Yeah, you and your two friends are going to make a mess. Or we make it situational. Or we make it optional. You cannot accept Jesus and then reject his word. You're going to have to follow his word. Look at me. Come back to the Bible. Come back to the Bible. Now, learn it and live it. Know it and do it. In the Sermon on the Mount, look with me in uh, Matthew chapter 7. Jesus said, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate. Notice a comparison here. He said, go through this gate. Because there's another gate. It's a wide gate. Narrow gate versus wide gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. He said, don't take that gate. Take this gate. Because you don't want that. Okay? And there are many who go in by it. Many people take the wrong gate. Go ahead. Because narrow or confined, it's precise, is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few that find it. So he shows two ways or paths or gates. He shows two groups, a large group and a small group. And he shows two very different outcomes. Let's skip down to verse 24. Jesus says, there, therefore, whoever, watch carefully, there, who, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine, come on, everybody, and does them, you hear them and you do them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the, the rock. Now, your house is your life. Your house is your life. What is the rock that you would build your life on that you hear and do? that you hear and do what what he says. Keep going. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. Now, first service, storm started right about then. (laughs) Come on, Lord. (laughs) And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. Come on, everybody. And it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. Okay, let's read on. But everyone who hears these saints of mine and does does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. What is sand? What is sand that you build your life on? You hear, but you don't do. You hear, but you don't do. Now, if you hear and you do, that's called what? Rock. But you hear and you don't do, that's called sand. Okay, now look what happens. And the rain, it's the same storm. It's described exactly. The rain descended, the floods came, The winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell. What happened to the other house? It did not fall. It stood. This one fell, and great was its fall. We've got two houses. We've got two builders. We've got two foundations. We've got two very different outcomes. We have the same storm. It's the same storm. They probably lived in the same town. They heard the sayings of Jesus. They might have even gone to the same church. 
But the difference is one built on rock, which means they heard and did, and the other one heard and did not do. Same storm, same storm comes, and we end up with, we end up with two different outcomes. You've got a larger group earlier that we talked about. They chose to go the way of the world, the way to destruction. You've got a smaller group chose to go God's way. I'm going to listen. And Jesus is further now refining this small group into a smaller group between the wise and the foolish. Storms come to everybody. Hello? Everybody has storms. I said everybody has storms. I don't care who you are. I've had people say, Pastor, I just wish I had your life. No, you don't. And I don't want yours. We all have storms. I said we all have storms. And don't let all your pretty celebrities tell you that life is just so good. Leave one husband or boyfriend two days later on the Mediterranean with new boyfriend. Aren't we beautiful and rich and famous and happy all the time? No. Put on a show. Don't let Hollywood be your guide for anything, okay? Nothing. I'm sure there's some beautiful and talented people, but without God, all of us are empty. And I don't want to hear your empty whatever when it's not real. And so what, what happens is storms come to every life, every life. I don't care how rich you are, how small you are, how, uh, how smart you are, how good looking you are, how powerful, how well placed, how well connected you are. Storms come to us all. As long as we're on this planet, you're going to have storms. And let me tell you about the storms. Some storms come because you messed up. You can create an, your own storm in your life. Could I be so bold? Has anybody here made your own storm before? Come on. Two hands. All two-handers come right over here. We got, we got room. We got room for you. Save me a seat. Some of your storms come because others messed you up. Some storms come because you have an enemy of your soul. And this is going to blow some of your minds. And some storms come because some things just happen. But storms come, and they, storm, they come to us all, and what matters is how we build our... No, nobody intends to build so it'll collapse. Nobody intends to. Everybody's got, you know, building on sand. The sand is fine in the sunshine. But storms do come. They come on this earth. And Jesus made it very, very clear. It's not, just a, it's not just a little cute little story here. There are deep principles that apply to our life. Build your house. Build your life on the rock. Hear and do. Come back to the Bible. Come back to the Bible and let it be authority in your life. Amen? Amen. Look in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2 in the message. You let the world, which doesn't know the first thing about living... Tell you how to live. You filled your lungs with polluted unbelief and then exhaled disobedience. Well, pastor, it sounds like you're really down on the world. No, no, no. I, I, love, I love people. I am hurting for people. Because we can't come up with our way through. We can't come up with our way out. We can't put that together. It, it, disconnected from God, we get lost again. So don't let the world that doesn't know the first thing about living tell you how to live. Here's what I would recommend for you. You ready? The most profound, come on, bring it up. The most profound decision you could ever make is to give the Bible first and final authority in your life. Listen, look at me. If you could know what God knows, if you could see what God sees, you would do what God said. I'll say it again. Wait, wait, wait. If you could know what God knows, if you could see what God sees, you would do what God says. You know, this is like having a, this is like having a guide 
Oh, if I were you, I wouldn't go this way. Why? Dead men tell no tales. <laughs> you know, somebody who's been there and could see, uh, it, no, no, I, if I were you, I wouldn't go that way. And yet it gets all painted up and presented to us in different ways. Now, oh, this would be great. You know, I'll throw off that religion. It tries to make you feel guilty about everything. Now, I'm telling you, if you could just know what God knows and see what God sees, you do what God says. And since I can't know fully what he knows, can't see fully what he sees, we do well. It's wise to just go ahead and do what he says. Amen. Amen. And once you give God's word first and final authority, that's what I believe. I believe you're going to hold this differently. I believe you're going to read it differently. You're going to listen to it differently. You're going to believe it differently. You're going to live it differently. When you accept that this is God's word and give it that place in your life, give it that place in your life where this is first authority, this is final authority. It's going to help you with everything in life and even after life. Amen? Hey, I've got a prayer for us to kind of seal this together. It's going to be on the screen. Let's all pray this together. Make this your prayer. You're going to read it, but make this your prayer right now with me. Come on, everybody together. Heavenly Father, let the light of your word shine down into the dark places of my heart. Let the promises of your word encourage my soul. Let the truth of your word reshape my attitudes and let the wisdom of your word guide me my decisions. Amen. Amen. Did y'all get anything at all out of this this morning? All right.